Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The word of God that serves as the basis for the sermon this morning comes to us from our first reading, 2 Kings chapter 4. In the name of Jesus, who is himself the source of all life, my dear Christian friends, Back in 1905, a man named Frederick Wells conducted a routine inspection of a diamond mining shaft, which he was supervising. And as he was going along, he happened upon a large chunk of uh, what appeared to be glass, almost, sticking out of one of the walls. And so he took out his own pocket knife and started to carve away at it. and brought out the funk. He, he was intrigued by it. And as he held it, his first thought that came to his mind was, this is really big. Too big to be a diamond. But what if? What if it is? So Wells took the stone back to the surface, and then he brought it back to some experts. And when the experts took a look at it, they threw it out the window, saying there's no way that it could be real. Then. You know, they, they just thought that it was worthless, that it was just a crystal. But then uh, he found out later, upon second inspection, that it was the biggest diamond that had ever been found. And it was incredibly heavy. Eventually, it was divided into different pieces, and the largest chunk of it became one of the crown jewels of the royal family of Britain. And it was named the Star of Africa. And it was a whopping 305 carats. Where is the Star of Africa to, uh, today? Well, it's, it's in the Tower of London uh, to be observed with the rest of the crown jewels. It's been inlaid in a scepter that the new monarch of Britain holds when they are uh, initiated. Isn't that fascinating? It went to the royal family. And you want to know what they paid for it? Nothing. It was a gift to the King of England for his 66th birthday. So a stone thought to be worthless by some turned out to be priceless and then was given away as a free gift without any cost. The Son of God descended into the darkness of this world of sin and death and he emerged on Easter Sunday as the first fruits of the resurrection of all of God's people. That is the crown jewel of the Christian faith and our source of hope. And this crown jewel of Christianity, the gift of resurrection, it won't cost you a thing either. It's a gift from the Son of God who came from the right hand of God and who came to write what was wrong. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. This gift is offered freely, without cost, to every man, woman, and child. But are they going to recognize the value of it? Or are some people going to take this gift for granted? For many people, uh, it seems like a worthless statement to say that Jesus is the resurrection and the life. But today, we're going to meditate on just what kind of value comes from this gift of life, both the first gift of life he gives to us and then life from the dead. And in the book of Second Kings, we're going to take a look at two parents' perspectives, different perspectives, when their son was brought back to life. Second Kings chapter 4 introduces us to a family that showed tremendous hospitality to Elisha, the prophet from God. A Shunammite woman and her older husband uh, let him eat and sleep in their home, and Elisha frequented their house so regularly that it was the wife's idea that they set aside a special room for him with a bed and a table and a chair and a lamp so that he could stay there in, in this room on their roof whenever he came to visit. And one time, Elisha was relaxing on the bed after a long, hard day, and he asked the woman, well, what can I do? What, what can I give to you? And the Shunammite woman said, oh, there's nothing really you could give to me. But Elisha said, I'm going to tell you this. A year from now, this time next year, you're going to be holding a child in your arms. 
which was very exciting news for a woman with an older husband. She had not really had any hope that she would have a child, yet she showed this tremendous hospitality to Elisha, and sure enough, even though she doubted at first, a year later, she was holding that child in her arms. We're, we're told the woman became pregnant, and the next year, about the same time, she gave birth to a son, just as Elisha had told her. You know, since the beginning of Scripture, God has reminded us that children are a blessing and a gift from God. And the son born at Shunem was no, was no different. He was born according to God's word, just as the prophet Elisha had said he would. Nevertheless, the God who had graciously blessed this family in Shunem now permitted tragedy to enter into their homes. We're, we're told that when the boy was still young, maybe he was eight years old, a young boy, he suffered what appears to have been a sunstroke. He was saying, my head, my head, and then he died the same day. The child grew, and one day he went out to his father, who was with the reapers, and he said to his father, my head, my head. His father told the servant, carry him to his mother. And after the servant had lifted him up and carried him to his mother, the boy sat on her lap until noon, and then he died. She went up and laid him on the bed of the man of God, and then shut the door, and then went out. This story is heartbreaking. A barren woman gives birth to the child, and then the child dies a while later. After so much hoping and so much praying for a child, she had had this son only for him to be taken away. All her, her hopes and her love had wrapped themselves up into this little boy until his head began to hurt. Can you imagine the crying and the tears that were shed that day as she held him on her lap? The death of a child is a solemn, a solemn reminder that even children are born with sinful hearts. They too die. Death has hounded mankind since the garden and has caused misery that God never intended for his children. Even though we weren't actually present in the Garden of Eden, we still have the effects in our lives today. We're told death came to all men because all sinned. Death itself is powerful evidence that people are sinners and in desperate need of a Savior. Satan wants us to forget those facts. He wants us instead to think that our children can go safely through a phase or a stage when they turn away from God and they go and sow their wild oats. But God has never promised that the child or, or we, for that matter, will live to see our next birthday. So he entrusts parents with the responsibility to take care of their children, not just physically, but spiritually. As we take a look at this account, we'll notice that the two parents had somewhat different responses to their child's death. Notice that it was the woman's idea, first of all, to provide the meals for the prophet and to build in that addition to their home. And it was the woman's idea uh, that when her son died, she went to lay his body on the prophet's bed and then went to the prophet himself in person. But the boy's father, he didn't bother to ask about his son's health. Instead, he had the servant carry him over to his mother as he stayed out in the fields. He just kept on working. And the only question he had about it was, do you really have to go see the man of God now? It's not like it's a Sabbath day or a new moon festival. It's, it's not like, you know, why would you go to church if there isn't a rule saying you have to legally go to church? What's that going to do? The husband gives the impression that he's an unbeliever, that he didn't really trust that the man from God could do anything to help their son. So we aren't surprised that the mother preferred to go to the prophet instead of her husband during the spiritual crisis. And that kind of hits home, doesn't it? Sadly, there are a lot of husbands today that follow this example. They work hard to provide physical and material needs for their families, but often they 
shirk their responsibilities as the spiritual head of the household. If a Christian woman today marries an unbelieving man, she can't expect her husband to understand her faith. Her husband isn't going to be able to comfort her when death comes into her life and into her home, and he's not going to be able to pray for her in times of spiritual distress or when, or as she walks through this life, laboring and suffering as a Christian does. Nevertheless, you take a look at the wife's attitude, and it was far different from the husband's attitude. Her faith was on clear display here. She, we're told that she took her servant with her, and she basically traveled 20 miles across the valley of Jezreel to find the man from God. Before her son was born, she had accepted the idea that she would die without a child. But now that she had held him in her arms and had been given this wonderful, miraculous gift of life, she wasn't quick to let it go. But you see here, her faith is being demonstrated as a daughter of Abraham, because Abraham too trusted that his son Isaac would be brought back from the dead one way or another. And that was the trust that she had too, whether her son would be raised in this life or the next. And by faith, that's exactly what happened. When Elisha arrived at Shunem, he didn't start doing CPR and other medical emergencies. Instead, what was the first thing that he did? He prayed. Some people don't see the value in praying, but that's exactly what Elisha did. And he prayed behind closed doors, just him and the boy, which is something Jesus later taught his disciples to do. Then he placed his body over the body of the boy, which is similar to what Elijah did with the little boy who died in Zarephath before him. So he laid on the son's body, and the body began to warm. But there was a moment of suspense there because the boy had not yet come back to life. And so really, you can kind of see God testing Elisha's faith too as he's pacing back and forth, waiting to see signs. And then, sure enough, finally, God did respond by bringing the boy from death to life a second time, giving him life. Here again, God showed that he alone is the giver of life. He is the source of all life, and he alone is the one who is able to deliver us, his people, from death. This is something that he has promised us for thousands of years, and he's delivered because he sent his son into the world, into this world of darkness, to not only die in our place, but then to rise from the dead. That is why he is called the first fruits of the resurrection. When you think of first fruits, that's an agricultural term, and that's something that I think a lot of us understand living in, 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 this, uh, in the Central Valley. When you take a look at first fruits, what indication does that give about the rest of the crop? If it's a good first fruit, it's going to be a good crop. And if Jesus is the first fruits of the resurrection, we know that our resurrection is going to be just as good and just as certain. In Christ, we trust for our resurrection. He alone brings us that life from death. In our gospel reading today, we were reminded that Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, will give resurrection and life to everyone who believes, whether they are adults or children, both us and the ones that we love. In baptism, Jesus raises us from spiritual death to spiritual life, and someday he's also going to lead us into eternal life, the joys of heaven. We need that reminder because in this broken world, not every little boy is going to rise from the dead. And not every sister is going to get their brother back in this life. But God broke into this world of death, first of all, to show that he could break into this world. Second of all, to point us to the time when he's not going to just do that with a couple examples. He's going to do that with us too. And third of all, he's going to, he did that to point us to the day that we get the crown jewel of Christianity, resurrection from the dead. When God brings our dead back to life and we get to be with them and hug them in our arms and dance with them in joy, the gift of life 
will abound forever in heaven in this world that will never end because it will not be cut short by death. Knowing that, being certain of God's promise, because God did come into the world, Jesus did die and he did rise from the dead, we can be certain of this, that we too will rise, and so we can persevere when things get hard. When our loved ones die, when death seems close for us in our present sufferings, even if our sufferings end in death, death itself doesn't phase us because really it's become temporary. In fact, death has become shockingly reversible through faith in Jesus. Death is the bitter lot that we inherited from Adam, but Jesus wants to know that even in the face of death and heart-rending tragedy, like the loss of a child, he still promises that whoever believes in him will live even though they die. Thanks be to God. Amen. The peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm.